Hello and welcome back for another California Geography Lecture. Uh, this one in particular is looking more at the culture of California, really the melting pot of the greater Los Angeles region. Uh, I, I, I'm going to present this a little differently just in the sense that we acknowledge that California is a melting pot of culture and diversity. And I can really show that through just a, a, a few examples of what Los Angeles has to offer. What's really different about this is the fact that we have just about everybody <laughs> in a little community in some portion of the greater Los Angeles area, and that's really unique and exciting. Uh, I often have to remind my friends who live in California that you know we're in a bubble in that sense, that we have very unique diversities of culture, of ethnic groups, of religion, and of language. And it's very it'd be very difficult to try to compare those values to really any other city or state in the world. You know, that we have to sometimes take a step back and be like, wow, you're right, we really do have all these unique features and, uh, and ideas and values. So that's what this is really about, is talking about the different cultures that make California what it is. Uh, and again, and we're looking mostly in the Los Angeles region. So let's start kind of where we left off on the last, last presentation, which is looking at Alvarez Street. So we know that Alvarez Street predates its formal founding in the 1930s. Uh, in fact, some of the buildings go back into the early 1800s, but it really wasn't until the 1930s that it began developing into a cityscape, uh, the little street itself. Now, as the town continued to grow during the 1900s, the historic era, area became very neglected and began serving more as a neighborhood for the new incoming uh, immigrants, many of which were Mexicans but and from Mexico, but a majority of them would actually come out of Italy and some Chinese. Uh, what was interesting about this is, yeah, perhaps you recognize this map on the bottom, and this is from the Sanborn Collection, but... Here we have Alameda with the train tracks. There's the big plaza in the middle, and here's Alvera Street here. Um, what's interesting is that there, Cal State Northridge has what's called a Sanborn Fire Map uh, Library itself. And what they are, it's, it's a bunch of maps that were done for fire insurance purposes. But what's really unique is that when you get into Alvera Street, what they would do is they'd come out and look and see what the building was made out of, what was the, uh, the, the occupations or the businesses being run there. And uh, you can definitely tell that as you know, economies changed and when things became more of a challenge that, in fact, many of the buildings actually turned into brothels. Um, and then they would, and later they transitioned to uh, different businesses and then to what they are today, you know, candle shops and stuff like that. But it's quite interesting to see how that changed uh, over time. Uh, using this map here, uh, Chinatown, majority of them lived here, uh, but uh, they didn't get to live there very long, and we'll talk more about that. But yeah, so as the original buildings in this area began to become neglected, because now a cityscape was being built around it, um, it's 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 that idea of opposite gentrification, where you have uh, neighborhoods that are being neglected, so people come in, they move in, and then they can make it their own, and then at some point it can become gentrified by people coming in and going, oh, this area is really nice, and I'm going to you know, buy out these small businesses and put in something bigger. Well, I mentioned it, but let's talk about Chinatown. Um, now, obviously, we're not, you know, this isn't the only Chinatown in, in California. We we and you are probably very uh, familiar with the one in San Francisco, but I want to specifically talk about things that are more tangible to where our location is. So this is a vintage uh, postcard, a colorized postcard of, uh, of Chinatown. And let's talk about that really quickly. So uh, established in 1870, um, across the street from Alvera Street, uh, and then... Due to uh, unfortunate events, uh, the internal corruption of the sales of drugs uh, and gambling, uh, the city was able to come in and remove everyone from Chinatown. So what ended up happening is, um, it, historically, uh, a lot of the Chinese railroad workers were known for opium. And uh, essentially, the city wanted that property to put a train station, so they busted a bunch of different... Um, venues and events and said, you know, we have to shut you down. We're going to tear the, the town down. This is one of the last parades in the original Chinatown there in 1930. So anyway, the city was successful in, in asking them to to uh, relocate uh, in order to make room for the new Union Station. 
the town was then uh, dismantled uh, and then rebuilt and to a, a larger uh, grandeur, if you will, uh, in 1939. And this is the original walkway, which you might, if you've been to, to Chinatown, you'll see a lot of this still there. Um, this is 1939, the new gateway to the new Chinatown. And there's a lot of great marketing about that. But uh, again, we're talking about displacement of people, right? Um, another group of people that make, made their home uh, in California, uh, a, a very large uh, German culture actually makes its home in a location called and around uh, Alpine Village. Uh, it's right outside of the city. It's close to Torrance. It's not quite Torrance, but they, it's close enough. It was an unincorporated part. So what's interesting about the Alpine Village uh, aspect of it is that Back in 1967, a group of German investors had decided that they wanted to bring Bavaria to the South Bay. Um, and by bringing Bavaria, they wanted to bring in not just um, you know the food and the, the music of the, the homeland in that sense, but more of bring in some of the elements that make it very unique, uh, the German culture, specifically uh, the Christmas markets and all the little village markets that they would do. So in 1968, just in time for the first Christmas market, uh, shoppers were welcome to over 13 acres of shops, of restaurants, banquet halls, dancing. Uh, and then from there, they were able to then replicate uh, an Oktoberfest uh, festival and, and ceremony. Uh, and with nearly 10,000 visitors, visitors alone for their annual Oktoberfest, it is actually ranked one of the most authentic Oktoberfests on the West Coast, and some even argue one of the most outside of Germany itself. Uh, here's another uh, vintage postcard and some uh, folks dancing. You know, again, why am I bringing this in here? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to think about these areas because uh, people who come from around the world go to these areas. They go to the Chinatown. They go to your Alpine village because maybe that's where they're from. They're looking for spices. They're looking for food. They're looking for language, things of commonality for people to talk with. Uh, speaking about uh, Germans, I thought this was kind of quite interesting. So for German Americans, there was actually three phases of migration uh, into the Hollywood Los Angeles area, and all three of them actually had to deal specifically with, with media, with movie studios. So the first one is the pioneers. Those are the people that came out between 1910 and 1931. Um, most of them, I've labeled two on the bottom there, uh, Carl and Marcus, which are sort of some of the founding individuals of those movie studios. So they came out here for the opportunity uh, to create Hollywood, right? There, what, there is uh, Hollywood uh, in Germany, in the surrounding area. It's one of the oldest movie studios uh, in Europe. But they wanted to come out here to America for the American dream. Then we found the second wave was the exiles. The exiles came between 1932 and 1945. Uh, those are the people that were uh, fleeing, uh, obviously, the, the war that they were experiencing there. Um, the World War, well, the latter part of World War One and World War Two. Then there's the contemporaries, which is everyone else that kind of comes in. And there's a lot of great resources on this. The contemporaries seem to be more of you know your um, your generalized population, but also your actors and actresses. Uh, so when I, th I threw this little photo here of Sid Grauman and Gene Harlow. Sid Grauman is the individual right here. Uh, perhaps you do not know who he is, but you would recognize his name for the Chinese theater. Uh, Sid Grauman was actually, he helped build the first movie palace that we have, the Million Dollar Theater. He also ended up building the Chinese theater and the Egyptian theater to bring you know more of this eloquent uh perspective of Hollywood, that you're not going to just a, a particular palace that's got, you know, rhinestones and, and gold, but you're going to go to uh, a movie theater that was very well themed and very unique in its own uh, right. But, um, but nonetheless, uh, all three of those movie theaters that he founded actually still exist. And what's really interesting, if you get a chance to go to the Million Dollar Theater uh, in downtown LA, um, during Halloween in particular, they still show films in the original theater on film, uh, not digital like we're used to, and they do a lot of uh, your black and white horror films, which is pretty cool. And there he is with Gene Harlow. Uh, the next group of people that I wanted to pick out was the Los Angeles, um, the, the Koreatown. Uh, Koreatown is really um, unique in that sense because we... We've had Koreans in Los Angeles for quite some time. Uh, by the 1930s, there were about 650 Koreans that resided in the Los Angeles area. Now, with the Mid-Wilshire area becoming vacated uh, in the 1960s due to economic decline, uh, it really attracted Korean immigrants uh, to make that area their home. Uh, what was interesting about that location is that during 
uh, the turn of the century, all the way up until really the 1950s, uh, what is identified now as Koreatown, the, the Mid-Wilshire area, was really a hot spot uh, for for Hollywood glam, if you will. Um, and as you can see, they had the Ambassador Hotel, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, they also had the Brown Derby and a bunch of other different elements that were in that area. Uh, but due to economic decline, uh, people started moving out. And a lot of these industries and buildings remained vacant. So the Korean culture actually came in because the property was quite inexpensive to rent it out and reopen some factories to be able to live you know, upstairs, run the factory down below, and start making the area their, their own, really. Uh, what was interesting also about it is that many of these buildings that were built in the 20s and 30s in the Mid-Wilshire area, um, when the Korean population moved in, they did not make any improvements to the exterior, uh, which was really great because they were able to keep the integrity of a lot of, a lot of the Art Deco buildings that had the terracotta facades. Um, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if it was really intentional, but probably more economical, if anything, because it's very expensive to replace facades in front of buildings. So it's probably cheaper to just maintain it, but nonetheless, it really keep, keeps um, that part of our history alive. You know, this, the official Brown Derby, part of the Brown Derby still does exist, not the way it looks or the way it was then, but it's quite unique. Um, more recent studies on the Korean town uh, proper area. Um, actually, 54% of the population in Koreatown is Hispanic at this point, uh, and that's a really interesting piece. You know, you have to think about why. You know, is it based based on uh, socioeconomics? Is it based off of, uh, of the distance to work? You know, from living to where your workplace is, or these you know, are people driving, or are they taking public transit, stuff like that. It's pretty interesting. Uh, let's talk about the Ambassador Hotel for a moment. That was really unique. Uh, opening in 1921, the Ambassador Hotel was one of Los Angeles' defining um, historic sites. Oops, misspell nightclub. Um, it was known for the uh, the Coconut uh, Grove nightclub, which is this photo here. I actually I have photos of my great uncle um, in the 40s dressed up, you know, exquisitely going into these celebrations where you can see there's palm trees inside the, this nightclub. There was um, a rotating dance floor, stages that popped up and down. It was quite crazy, very insane, yet everyone was dressed very eloquently. Um, the Ambassador Hotel uh, was had other elements to it as well. They hosted six Oscar events, um, and they've hosted every president between Herbert Hoover and Nixon. So it was really kind of like, you know, the 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 best place to stay. Um, the hotel closed in 1989, uh, and then uh, LAUSD bought it to build three schools for Koreatown, which the, the schools themselves were quite impacted. And then they didn't. And then the building was actually demolished in 2006, unfortunately, with just the foyer remaining. Uh, another piece of its history is that um, Senator Robert F. Kennedy uh, here was actually assassinated in the Ambassador Hotel as well. So a different group of people. Let's talk about Allensworth, uh, the the Freedom Colony. This is actually quite interesting. Uh, I I had not known a lot about this until I looked more into it uh, in grad school. But I thought this was something very you know neat to share. So um, in August of 1908, Colonel Allen Allensworth uh, from the Civil War actually came out this way with four other settlers to establish a farming town founded and financed and governed by specifically African Americans. So it was designed to be uh, essentially its own little colony, if you will, of being self-efficient, uh, self-sufficient, and to be able to provide opportunities that otherwise was not available um, in other uh, regions of the country. So their dream of developing an abundant community stemmed directly from a strong belief of programs that would allow blacks um, to, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, to, uh, to have themselves create a better life. Uh, so it, it was fully, like I said, uh, sufficient. They had their own agriculture, water. It, it was a very uh, important piece of this landscape. Uh, by 1910, uh, it was very successful. Uh, many people were living and moving up in the area, working in that area. Uh, unfortunately, after Allen's death, uh, and then the area in Tulare uh, experienced extreme drought for about f almost a decade. It was five to seven years. Um, most of the town fell into uh, disrepair by uh, World War One. Oh my goodness, what is going on here? Uh, by World War One, uh, then the town sat vacant for quite some time. Uh, and now it's a state park. You can actually go visit, and a lot of the buildings are obviously still there. But it's just a very interesting piece of history that uh, was very successful for a lot of people and provided people in California to come out this way, uh, an opportunity to be um, independent. 
which is great. Uh, the last one I'll talk about very quickly is Little Armenia. Again, you know, all these little regions, we know, at least hopefully you do, there's not really like a drawn line on the ground that says that this is what it is. It's a very um, justified area. We just kind of say it's within this. This was an older map of Little Armenia. Uh, but Little Armenia is really unique. So with the turbulent situations in Lebanon, Egypt, and Iran in the 1970s, uh, many Armenians actually came to the U.S. via the family reunification channel. So... You know, we have this process uh, in which if there's a situation um, that you can be re reunified with your family, uh, whether you have papers or not, you get priority um, into this country. Uh, the first significant wave of immigration was actually the result of the Armenian genocide in 19, well, between 1915 uh, and 1921. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. Um, so as of uh, 1993, Little Armenia has the densest population of Armenians in the world outside of Armenia itself. Uh, some fun facts. Uh, the first Armenian came to Los Angeles in about 1900. The second Armenian, uh, there, it's very ambiguous. He might have been, might have been brothers involved, but they essentially opened up a, an oriental uh, rug trading uh, business in downtown L.A. And that, that second set... <laughs> of Armenians, if you will, uh, was really the, the breaking ground point to allow a lot of others to be able to escape or to seek refuge here in the United States because uh, they were able to maintain strong communication um, and then to be able, because they were related, to bring families over here. Since there was a job and a business waiting, uh, it's a lot more efficient and effective to bring people over because you already have a, they're not going to be, um, you know, a hardship on society because people are going to have a place, a home, and a job. Uh, that being said, uh, if you go over uh, into kind of the East LA area, uh, in 1968 they opened up the Armenian Genocide Monument. Uh, it, it was erected uh, to acknowledge the 1.5 million victims of the Armenian Genocide. And this is actually the oldest Armenian Genocide uh, Monument uh, in the United States. It was the first, uh, and but not the last, but definitely the first and the, one of the oldest. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to go visit it, it's, it's actually quite impressive. It's eight very, very large columns uh, that was, it was designed to you know, uniquely um, hold this, this pillar piece up on top, but nonetheless, it, very unique. So, uh, at any rate, uh, I just wanted to kind of introduce a bunch of the different, uh, the groups, ethnic groups, and cultures that have come in and kind of, you know, made California the diverse place that it is. Are there others? Oh my gosh, absolutely. You know, I, I could speak forever on this because we can, we can talk about Little Italy. Uh, you can talk about then looking beyond, uh, oh, God, Little Persia, and, and but anyway, uh, moving in, in Northern California, you have your own other set of stuff in San Francisco. Um, I mean, other uh, groups of people that were up there, you know, aside from indigenous, obviously, I know that we kind of danced, we didn't really talk about that in this presentation, the people that were here to begin with, but we kind of mentioned that earlier uh, in presentations. But um, I hope that you understand that, you know, Cal when we say that California is a melting pot, we're not lying. It really has so many different people. And again, it, you know, why is this important? Well, if someone's coming, I'll give an example. Uh, maybe there's an international student who's coming from Korea or from China or from uh, Armenia or from Russia, anywhere, right? And they come here and maybe English is going to be a second language. They're going to move into these areas because there's going to be people there that they know are going to speak the same food. They're going to be able to order food from restaurants because they know their culture is going to be represented and they're going to have that place for home. So, I don't know, if you can kind of think about it in that perspective, maybe you know people who do that, it's like, oh, you know, maybe, I mean, I have a lot of friends that are Korean, and they know that Korean barbecue is not a real thing. It's one of our things. But are there other things that they go to, maybe kimchi or something like that? They go to these smaller places, the pastries and stuff like that. It's just very interesting to see what people do that. And, and maybe you, you know someone who does that, especially when it comes to spices and stuff, that you go to these smaller markets that you, you would never be able to find um, these particular spices or meats or whatever it might be at a Ralph's or Vons, you'd have to go to these very unique markets. You know, maybe for little Germany, you know, maybe you're looking for a very, you know, sauerkraut that we know is very different than the sauerkraut in Germany. Uh, so maybe you want authentic sauerkraut. Well, you'd have to probably go there to get it from one of their markets. It's most um, relevant or most uh, realistic to what you'd remember at home. Uh, but nonetheless, I guess hope this was kind of interesting for yourself and that you enjoyed it. Um, that being said, I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll talk soon.